Um, LCA, thanks for asking me to come back again. I'm surprised after last time, but anyway, I hope that um, I can do justice to these people that I try and represent, and that is the Bushmen, and share their message, which uh, I consider of vital importance to, to all of us. This picture you see here was taken in the central Kalahari, um, looking out from one of the few hills there. And what the Bushmen are pointing at is the area in which they once were able to call home until they were kicked out. And also it is um, the land where they said they had all that they needed. That was our pantry, that was our kitchen, that was our chemist, we needed no more. And then one other thing which I found rather interesting is that they say that compared with 50 years ago, there's a lot more bush. And uh, the, before that was mostly grass and small shrubs. So it would appear that, and in terms of what William Bond told us, that perhaps the trees are growing in order to try and uh, compensate for the extra CO2 that we have. So people, tonight I'm gonna to be talking about um, a Bushman greeting, are your eyes nicely open? which I think might have, or I believe has got more than one meaning, which we are going to be discussing. Yeah. Right, um, I also asked people who may have heard my last talk to bear with me, because um, this is a picture from the last talk, and so there will be some repetition to set the context of what I'm gonna be talking about today. And this once again is a, a picture of from the Kalahari area, which was home to, to the Bushmen and one of the areas where there still is quite a bit of grass left. My motivation for, for these talks is our wildlife and these beautiful creatures that we are so lucky still to be able to see, but for how much longer, I do not know. And then of course, my ambition is to try and to help with whatever conservation um, methods are in place and other ideas to try and make sure they're around for as long as possible. But I'm afraid other than just losing so much of our wildlife, as you all know, we do have bigger problems. And the bigger problems have been highlighted in a book which has been written by Sir David Attenborough. I don't know how many of you have had a chance to read it. It's called A Life on Our Planet. And it actually deals with his life story, his witness statement. And I detect a, sort of, a certain level of desperation and that with all the efforts that have been put in place through all the conservationists that are working so hard to save our world, uh, we are sliding rather rapidly. And one of the articles that are in the book is about planetary boundaries, which you're not going to be able to read, at, read here on the screen, but it gives you an idea of the representation that has been done by Earth scientists of what is happening to our planet. And it is an enormous problem. It basically, identifies the critical areas um, that are important for the stability of our planet. And it explains how we have actually exceeded four of the boundaries already, which can destabilize our planet. And we are heading outwards as this diagram represents on a number of others as well. So we really are at a critical time and hopefully not too late to make some urgent changes. Now I wanna talk about the symptoms and causes um, I have mentioned this before, and although there's amazing conservation work being done to address the symptoms of our disappearing natural world and our natural world that is in a state of um, distress and dis-ease, we are mostly dealing with the symptoms. I started off by looking at a number of the things, in particular working with communities, because I recognize the importance of the, the communities that were in the bordering our natural areas. And I found this as, as an ongoing um, challenge and many people are trying to deal with this. But just to give an idea of one comment that came from a person that I was working with, she was one of the leaders in the community. And I was trying to talk about the importance of conservation. And she basically said, it's all very well for you people that are living comfortably to talk about conservation now that you have got everything in place whereas we are battling to get onto the ladder. And she, she basically said that um, they are really not totally committed to this until they have managed to catch up to a certain extent. And this is rather a concern. So 
I think that this challenge is just going to be ongoing and increasing. So we've got to do a lot more to look at something beyond just the symptoms. And as she said to me, it's our turn to feed at the trough, which was uh, really concerning for me to hear. So what about addressing the cause? Do we know the cause? And I think that we can look at the one in particular that I'm going to be addressing today. And that, of course, is in the human mind. We know the human is behind the, the problems that we are facing. And the human mind is the most important habitat for all our wild creatures. And can a study of the culture of our first people, in other words, in this case, the Bushmen, provide some insight into this cause and the workings of the older first human minds? Just to refresh and to put other people in the picture, just to talk about some of the things that really have captured my imagination and um, work with working with the Bushmen. Of course, the indig indigenous knowledge is, is incredible. It is profound. I mean, to go out to the bush with these Bushmen and see how much they know about the plants and the trees and the animals, it is really, it is really fascinating. And there's so much knowledge there, which I don't know that has all been captured in our modern world. There are the skills that we see, the fire making and the trap making and all that, which are also fascinating. And on the recent trip, I saw another way of making fire, which I hadn't seen before, where they use a mushroom that grows on a log that they say comes after the storm. And they make charcoal out of it as a black powder and they keep it in a container. And all they need to do is get one spark onto this powder and that is the fire started. So I haven't looked into the physics of this, but it's just ongoing as to how much fascinating stuff you can see that the Bushmen are able to share. And then, of course, the area to me which is of great importance is this, their spirituality, their ability to correct, to connect directly which, with the universe, with universal intelligence. Now, we may want to call this God, we may want to call this the Great Spirit, whatever it might be, I'm just going to give it a general term of a universal intelligence. And there is so much evidence of how they are able to connect and gain information and insight into things that we do not even understand. Another thing that for me became very, very important was these revelations that I had not expected. And that was firstly the level of happiness that I actually recognized in, within the Bushmen, which was not expected when the Bushmen should not be happy at all, having no possessions and no status, status, which we value so highly, they were so happy and so content that it made me question so much of what I'd actually learned or what I've known about life and through my education. And then the other thing, of course, was their survival duration, how long they've been around on the planet. And it goes into tens of thousands of years. And during all that time, they did not destroy their environment, their planet at all. So what did they perhaps do that enabled them to actually look after our planet far better than we are doing? And then I also thought about this word, the indigenous wisdom. And what is the true nature of this wisdom? We've heard about it so often, but I'm going to get back to that in a, a little later. One of the very important um, activities of the Bushmen or rituals is the healing dance ritual. I consider this important because it's aimed at a holist holistic and preventative healing. And I'm also going to get to this a little bit later in a bit more detail, <clears throat> but it addresses and describes the four cornerstones upon which their survival success was built. And the end result is confirmed by anthropologists as their culture being considered the most successful in human history. And yet it is so surprising that there's so little work done in really trying to analyze their culture, which is what I'm trying to do as really a total amateur. Now, just to look at some of the factors that have, that have contributed to their success. Firstly, human values are considered very important to them. Love is very much a big part of their lives, the caring and compassion that they share for each other and their connection within the groups and within their 
communities. So a community was considered far more important than any individual. They believed that no individual can survive without a community, but you can only really um, be successful if you work together as a community and not as individuals. So a community can survive without an individual. And if an individual did not tow the line, they made life very difficult for them. This was considered very important. And community was considered really one of the purposes of life is to serve community. And then when we talk about happiness, they do not understand why we want to seek happiness. Their idea was to rather to avoid unhappiness and those things that caused unhappiness. For example, jealousy, um, individualism, and inequality. So they developed a culture which addressed those problems, which is why they became egalitarian and avoided a number of those issues that cause unhappiness. And then, of course, the protection of the environment. I mean, they have been called nature's children, but they really understood the importance of protecting the environment. And these, of course, are all the things that contributed towards their long successful life, life on, on our planet. And then a huge one was the suppression of ego. Now there are some people that tend to think that the Bushmen are maybe less evolved. But when you actually talk to them and let them explain to you their understanding of the ego, you will know that these people are a lot more sophisticated than what we believed. And they recognized the danger of ego which I'm going to be talking about shortly. So this describes really what the Bush, Bushmen considered importance for their continued um, happiness and living on our planet. Quenjima was the man not is. They associated that, that was a name that they gave to, to people that had ego and that for them meant bad temper or aggression, greed, superiority and inferiority and power. Laziness was not tolerated. And then of course, fear and inverted commas because they did not live with the fears that we live with today. They had a far different approach to their world and they weren't subjected to the rule of fear that um, our society is actually living with today. And then of course, for love, it was friendliness and generosity. Giving was very important in their culture and there was no a currency, so you gave presents. And it was as if they understood then how important this was to their emotional well being is to give. And then, of course, wisdom they understood wisdom rather to mean people that were older and had uh, more experience. And they described that as wisdom. And then, calmness um, and good humor. Once again, for them to understand how, hum how important humor was in their lives is or shows a high level of sophistication. And it helped them to get through the tough lives that they really did live for much of the time or part of the year, humor was very useful. And then when I finished off in my last talk, I asked a few questions, which I've listed a few of here. And that is how did egalitarianism become hierarchies and inequality? Why did sharing become ownership? How have humans managed to become masters of the natural world or believe that they are masters of the natural world? And then intellect, which we value highly, how did that replace universal intelligence? Happiness and happiness become an event or a destination. And we become our. Cooperative companionship become competitive detachment. We are competitors in everything. So it is very difficult for humans to work together now because we have got our egos to satisfy and competition has actually boosted those egos. And suppression of ego become boosting and exploitation of ego. And less has become never enough. How have these changes come about? What has caused it? And here, of course, we get to the word which we've heard a lot about recently on the show as well. And Adam Cruz has written a book, which is called, I think it's, um, it's not about the bats, which describes how anthropocentric humans are today. And that diagram basically explains how man believes that he is superior to all other creatures in the universe, including women and even to other men. And 
At the same time, we also have the sixth mass extinction, and this is due to human behavior, and anthropocentrism obviously has got a lot to do with this. Human impact has been so profound that it has been used to name a geological period in the Earth's history. And this is what um, Sir David Attenborough talks about. Our Holocene period, which has run since our last ice age, is now being replaced by the Anthropocene. And this is the period which has had such a significant impact on our planet that it's actually going to be named in geological terms. But let's take another look at this anthropocentrism and ask other questions, because the picture you see on the right there actually represents the way the Bushmen and other indigenous people look at the natural world, where they consider themselves just part of the world. So we must actually then ask, were humans always anthropocentric? And the answer is definitely no, because we know the Bushmen weren't. And then another question, are humans born anthropocentric? Is a little child really anthropocentric? And I suggest that in both cases, the answer is no. Now we also know the Bushmen talk about a life force, something which man has not been able to create. They call it Rom. And that life force is an energy or force that connects all life on earth. And they imagine this as a type of golden web. So when some of the healers describe to me how they see this web, they see it as connecting to actually connect or every life form on earth. And they see that this golden web emanates in like a rope from what they call the sky god as an actual expression of his love. So they express, uh, they express the life force in terms of love and see it as connecting all creatures on the earth. And they did not consider themselves more important or even cleverer or more intelligent than any other species. Now we know that, and they, that they did not support competition. So they avoided competition to prevent hierarchical st structures. Because one of the comments they actually make to me, they say, what is the point? of finding winners. Are you creating winners or are you creating losers? They would rather avoid this, they say, because it, it causes unhappiness. So very different to our way of thinking. Now, we've already heard, and I think all of us know that we have entered a period of the sixth mass extinction. I just have a swallow represented there, a little um, striped swallow, that at the moment we may see plenty from time to time, but those swallows actually rely on insects for, for life. And we are losing up to 200 species per day on our planet. And are these swallows gonna be one of them shortly because we have lost up to 80% of our insects in many places on the planet. So what impact is that gonna have on the swallows? They're also ultimately gonna feel the brunt of what humans are doing to our planet. And this is the consensus. What the problems we are facing is due to the behavior of modern humans. But strangely, we must ask, why has this threat of extinction come from the most intelligent of species? How was such an apocalypse, which we are really facing right now, how has it, be, how has it been avoided by other species for millions of years? Now, I want to ask the people here that know more about it than me, but I ask myself the question about what is meant by instinct. I've looked up the definition of instinct and it tells us that it's an innate propensity in certain lower animals to certain seemingly rational acts performed without conscious design, which means without thinking these animals performed acts that have kept them alive. And the general understanding is that this instinct is hardwired into our DNA. In other words, it is part of our genes and the cells within our body. But what then is the nature of the so-called sixth sense? Has this got anything to do with instinct? How are the lower animals able to respond to environmental messages? Now here I just mentioned just a couple to explain what I mean. If any of you have actually read about the hundred monkey phenomenon, you will know how the monkeys, the macaque monkeys in Japan, were able to communicate with monkeys on other islands and on the mainland um, for, by some way that we do not know without having any physical interaction. 
And the only explanation really is that there is some connectivity to some external intelligence, which we are not really a fay with. And is this part of the sixth sense? In the same way, how do animals disappear or go to high ground when there's a tsunami as happened in Thailand uh, a couple of years back? What is it that they are able to actually, enables them to be able to interpret these messages? The Bushmen say animals are even cleverer than them. How do they know that they can have more than one calf, for example, um, when the rains come, when they fall pregnant before the rains even come? There's a connectivity that we do not understand. Where does that fit in? Is that part of instinct? If so, it's not hardwired into our DNA. There's something else. And then what has separated humans from other species that we are not able to hear these messages? Now, there's an explanation here that comes um, through the evolution of, of humans, and that is the development of the frontal cortex. Biologists describe the evolution of the human nervous system resulting in a bigger brain and a larger frontal cortex, which has been described as the human by uh, Professor Stephen Peters, as we'll see in a moment. And this enabled the capacity of humans to think and cognitive behavior, behavior through knowing. And Edward Griffiths, an Australian biologist, uses a stork to describe this evolutionary process. He describes a stork flying from Africa into Europe. And for thousands or tens of thousands of years, he's just followed his instinct and flown with some cues that have come through nature that have said it's time to go. But this stork, which was aptly named Adam, um, one day sees an island off to his, to his east or to his western side as he's flying. And he thinks for the first time, I'm gonna go and have a look-see there. He has now become curious. So for the first time in his life, this stork has actually developed some type of ability to think. And that is how he describes it, what's probably happened with humans. And this is described in the Bible as the actual picking from the tree of knowledge when man developed the ability to think and to know. And this, of course, meant the emergence for the first time of the thinking self or ego. So now we've got two sources of information or driving forces within the brain. And the one is instinct. And the other one is the thinking self, which we call the ego, or the ego is also sometimes referred to as the illusion of self of who we may, who we think we are. So it's all about the thinking versus our instincts. And of course, with that, the beginning of intellect and the knowledge that humans now possess. Let's have another look at intellect now. And this has become obviously the basis upon which nearly all decisions are made today. And it's described as a faculty of knowing, reason, and understanding in humans. But how complete or accurate is our human knowing? And by this, I mean, how does it compare with all knowledge that is out there? What are we excluding when we only use what we know or think we know? Intellect can be described as secondhand information because most of our intellect has been recycled. There's very little of all the knowledge out there that we've actually learned from ourselves firsthand. And with all this, our brains are, have a neuroplasticity, which means that our brains really are putty and they can be molded into different shapes depending on the forces acting on them. And how much do we know is actually true? Fake news has become huge. In the present day, they're even talking about deep fake and as a time of war and propaganda, etc. There are so many or so much information out there which is very questionable. And thinking of solutions is limited to what we know, i.e., to what is stored in our human database, which is our parietal lobe. So here we've actually got to say, and I have my colleagues that sometimes say to me, you know, it's too late now, we're not going to save our planet. It's impossible, but I believe if we rely purely on intellect to save it, we do have a problem, but I think there is reason to start looking at other forces or other sources of information to help us solve the huge problems that we face. 
Now we know that these problems come from the human psychological mind, the human brain that I spoke about earlier. And here's another interesting book that some of you may wish to read. It has all sorts of applications. And this is written by Professor Stephen Peters, who is a consultant psychiatrist to some of the Olympic teams in the, in, in the, in the UK. And we know that the human psychological mind actually basically controls our human behavior. And the psychological mind, he says, is made up of three lobes. That's the frontal or human, which we were describing just now, which deals with logic and reason. And then we have the limbic, which is our emotional machinery, which he calls a chimp, because he can be a chimp. It can really um, confuse our lives and cause sometimes irrational behavior. So there's conflict between these two, the frontal and the limbic. The limbic works faster than the frontal. So obviously we have the fight or, or flight syndrome coming from the behavior of the chimp. Between the two, they eventually feed the parietal lobe, which he calls a computer. And that is like the human database. But there's no guarantees that between the human and the, and the chimp, that the information that has been fed into this pedriparietal is absolutely correct. So from this, we have a problem which we, we face, which is mind conditioning. It doesn't have to be a problem, but it depends on who is doing the conditioning. So, and in addition to the susceptibility of psychological conditioning of our brains due to neuroplasticity, Humans have a second weakness, which is associated with the limbic area of our brains, which I've just mentioned, that is our emotional machinery. And the reality is that desire trumps logic and common sense. So very often we know what's right. And I think many of us here tonight listening know the way we should be living. But there are other forces and desires which are actually having an impact on our decisions and what society is imposing on us. So... Between these two, we have got a behavior which is controllable. So if we can control desire or forces can control desire, it also means that we're going to control the human mind. And for example, we have now got necessities only, which not we now got. This is the way the Bushmen lived, actually living in a minimalist, minimalistic lives and looking for necessities only to survive. These have now become, or has become changed to material accumulations in terms of our perception of success. When you ask today or talk about someone being successful, it is all about their material wealth or material accumulations and status. So that now, once that is set as a target, then that becomes our desire. So it just indicates or shows how our human minds are so easily controlled. And if they're on the wrong hands, well, then we have problems, which is what we have today. I now get back to a cornerstones of the cultural success of the Bushmen. In other words, to look at what they consider to be success. I've used a tree as a metaphor. Now, this is an incredible thing. The tree is something, one of the greatest creations, I think, of um, our natural world. In the bottom right-hand corner there, I've, I've got the word in Lom, which is the life force which is recognized in all living matter, all living uh, organisms, including the trees. The people of South America, for example, they don't see a tree as we do. They consider the essence of the tree to be its life force. But for us, we are concerned mostly with the leaves and the fruit maybe and flowers and then possibly the wood and that is about the limit of it. But now we can use this as an analogy here as to how the Bushmen viewed their own lives and their own persons. The top of the tree could be um, associated with the physical health, the physical health of the Bushmen. They ate healthy food, they exercised, and there was fasting, sometimes unwillingly, but it all contributed to a healthy life. I know they went through hardship and sometimes not much food, and some may even succumb to that, but generally they are very healthy people. And then the trunk of the tree is associated, or they associate with the psychological well being. And that is the preventing of unhappiness, the connection to community, love, giving humor, and the things we've spoken about already. 
and then underneath the ground, something which is largely uh, neglected by our societies in our world today is our spiritual health, which they consider to be the direct connectivity to the source. In other words, a connection to the ineffable truth, which means the truth without words. And it's a web of connectivity that they say connects, as we mentioned earlier, all life on earth. And they believe that humans are spiritual beings, not material. One description is that our bodies are merely the shadows of our spirits. So therefore, if you want to heal the body, you heal the spirit. So the whole idea that we are really spirit, and another word for spirit basically in, in science would just be energy. We are energy and vibrations, something which is not considered in our lives today. So if you take those three concerning the human, uh, the, the Bushman uh, body, their physical health, psychological health, and spiritual health were all dealt with in their healing rituals. So they reminded their people and their communities on a regular basis of how important these were, and they practiced these. This ritual, the, the healing dance, was practiced at least once a week in times gone by. So once again, this is a type of conditioning, but it was a conditioning for the good of all and not just for the few, as is the case today. And then, of course, in addition to this, the fourth leg of the Bushman corners of success or pillars of success is environmental health and how they lived a life according to necessities only. The one third principle is one that is often spoken of. You do not take one third of any resource. And another thing which I see on a regular basis, which I hadn't come across before or even read about before, is their process of replanting the roots or seeds as they progress, saying that this is for those that follow. So the idea that they just took and moved on like locusts is certainly a, an image which is actually rather naughty because this is not the way our first people lived at all. Now, if we look at some of the evidence from modern science, it is ironically intellect in the form of science that gives credence to many of the indigenous beliefs. I'm just gonna take two examples that I've read about recently. Bruce Lipton is a stem cell specialist from the States, and he has been studying uh, human cells of which apparently there are about 50 trillion in, in the, each body. And these are replaced at a rate of about 3 million a second. What he did is take cells and grew them in petri dishes and made a very interesting observation after many trials. And that is he found that these cells grew differently depending on the environment in which they were grown, which actually makes us question a lot of the Darwinian theories, which we, in which we believed that survival always depended on, on, our, on our genes. Whereas he is actually saying that there is a connectivity of our cells with the environment that has a lot to do with our survival. So we're going to have to do a lot to check up our performance and look after our environment. The other thing he found, which I also found very interesting, is that by studying each cell, he described the actual surface of the cell as a type of antenna which was used to actually connect with the environment. And this could describe how the living cells interact with the environment in which they're in. And it could even describe how our process of evolution has taken place by this connection between the cells and the environment around it. And of course, we know that quantum physics is probably our most modern of our, of our scientific uh, prevails. And those that have done any science will know that the human body or any body or any matter is 90% or 99% space. And that the only solid part of any atom is the nucleus. And later science says that even the nucleons, protons, neutrons, and all the other organic or um, nuclear particles are also possibly only dense forms of energy. So we are really mostly empty space 
and made up of energy and vibrations. And that is why this quantum physics quotation comes from the latest journal on quantum physics that was released in, in the UK, that the earth is immaterial. That really is food for thought, whereas we are focused totally on the material. They are finding out more and more that there is the immaterial nature of our spirits and energies, which is or requires a lot more attention. So I'll ask the question now, we get back to the, the, the heading that I dealt with here, and that is, are your eyes nicely open? So this is a greeting that is used by the Bushmen. And they sometimes, when they look at me, they smile and they say, they are actually also asking further or deeper question. Are you spiritually aware? And it is interesting that even in our Nguni people in South Africa, they ask the question or greeting that they use as Salborna. Now, Salborna means that I see you. And the older people tell me that it's, when they say I see you, they are saying or asking, or I see your spirit. So there is something in common that comes out here that goes way back in time from our people or our ancestors that were far more spiritually aware. But we also need to ask, in today's context, do we realize that we are being programmed, programmed to consume, not to conserve? So this is where pro programming and conditioning becomes very dangerous. And there's no doubt that our lives today are actually being programmed to consume so that those that are in a place of benefit are able to benefit from our consumption. And we need to ask our younger generation or encourage them to open their eyes and to start demanding answers to questions. So whatever forum that they may be in, I think it's time not to take things for granted and to start asking deeper questions. They need to ask if humans are making progress, these are just examples, what is a deemed goal? We keep on hearing that you cannot stop progress. But what is the progress to what goal? We need to ask, how can sustainable growth be possible? Sustainable means forever. How is sustainable growth possible? And then why is our threat of mass extinction not prioritized in our education? I come from an education background and talking to some of my colleagues who are still teaching, other than bringing in um, latest technology, et cetera, basically, we are all still being programmed to feed a system which is based on growth, a, an economic system which requires growth in order to survive. And this, of course, can't last and it probably is cracking up already. Now, here's an example of a question that I must ask, and this is evidence that is rather disturbing. I wrote a blog article many, many years ago, all about 2018, about the little guy on the left, which is called, who I call Rain Child, because he was born in December in the month of the, of the rain. His proper name is Kukatu, but he was very keen little bushman, came to the bush with us whenever he could. And there's a picture of him as a little bushman. I don't know if he pictures himself as probably a little bushman hunter. Now in May, I've just come back from uh, the Kalahari again, a few weeks back. This is a picture taken of the same the same child. He is now probably 13, where he was about nine when I took that first picture. He is now living in a, in a society, in a, in a camp, which provides a, a missionary school. And he is eating foods, our Western foods, and being fed Western education. And this is what he looks like. Now, it makes me think about articles I've read about the states and that 74% of people in the states that died from COVID died from issues related to obesity. Now, is this the kind of progress that we see that is going to benefit our Africans to learn our Western culture and to be fed our Western foods? So, I think we've got to take a look at what civilization means and, and, and do a rain check on that one. I'm introducing a program uh, for young people, which I've called the CAST program. 
so that we can get together and join the Bushmen to get some young people to come and preferably young students from around the world to come and experience from them for themselves um, what it's like to actually live with a Bushman. I'm not capable of actually describing this and it's almost impossible to describe the energy and the atmosphere that exists in a Bushman camp when you spend time with these people, their happiness and their joy. And our young people are going to bear the brunt of our human disconnection and our dysfunctional behavior. And I think that they need to be given opportunity to make some decisions and find out for themselves how our ancestors actually lived and survived. So the student program that I've actually uh, starting to put together and, and looking for sponsorship is called the CAST program because I believe that technology alone will not save us. Young people who are far more afraid than me, as Marith would actually tell you after today as well, um, to use technology for the purpose of spreading a message. And that what we actually need is cultural and spiritual transformation, hence the name cost. Because unless we change the culture and the way in which we live and actually become spiritually reconnected to the ineffable truth, and to the energies of the universe, I think that the prognosis is going to be rather sad. So can our young people learn to once again connect with community, the inner self, and to hear the voice with no words, as the Bushmen call it, when they connect with, their, with universal intelligence, that's where they believe their inspiration came from. And this also then um, answers one of the questions which I asked the Bushmen and about their nature of their wisdom. And they believe that they are not wise, but they are connected to where the wisdom is, where all information is. So they will not claim any fame or recognition for any wisdom they may have because they'd say that wisdom comes from another source. Are we still connected to that source? And I don't think that we are. So, to finalize, I want people just to, our young people really to consider the words of a song, which the Bushmen quite often sing. And these words say, leave no footprints in the sand, which cannot be erased by light breeze, light breeze. Now, how different that is from the way we live today. And this, I think is probably where we need to all start with immediate effect, and that is to stop consuming and stop or actually avoid the pressure that has been placed on us to avoid to, to consume because it is actually destroying us and change our priorities rather to conserve what we've still got left. Thank you. move on to the chat section we are going to uh to the live questions in the audience uh, judith you are up first i'm going to ask to unmute and then you have the screen thank you um i have only one sorry i have only one real question to ask and that is that i'm on i'm totally on clive's side but why does he say that the Bushmen are such a successful nation? Nation, they're not. They're being, they're being excluded. They're being uh, thrown, thrown off their original lands. They're being exterminated. They're not part of this country. We may have Bushmen. Uh, What's the word? The motto for the country is a Bushman uh, motto, but it's this doesn't mean success to me. These people are actually having their land in a way, and they're not being recognised for the wonderful legacy that they've left us. So my question really is: is what what is Clive's definition of success? Thank you, Judith. Clive, I'm just going to ask you to unmute and then you can answer. Right. Hello, yep. Hello, Judith. Yes, that Hello. is a very good question. 
And Judith, I think that, you know, what I've actually said that the anthropologists are calling them the most successful society in human history. I think because they actually survived for so long, whereas our society um, is not likely to survive much longer. So I think if that was the actual um, criteria they were using, that actually is, is, is why they call them the most successful. But in terms of why they're not successful today, um, well, I think that we are looking at totally different criteria. A Bushman could not ever be successful in accumulating assets and actually um, and status when that is totally contrary to everything that they believe in and their spiritual belief tells them that they would never ever want to compete in a game in which the rules uh, or the prize was to actually be um, uh, to have material wealth and status. So th I think that competition um, would not exist in their minds and much of what the Bushmen um, have not done I think is because of the warning signs that went off in their instinctive brains about many things that they could have perhaps done that they recognize as being dangerous to, to their own society and to the future of mankind and the planet. Okay, so in my view, <laughs> then if the whole of the capitalist corporate world dies, they'll be left. And that to me would be the, the best possible answer for the world. But I'm not sure it's going to happen. <laughs> no, Judith, you actually absolutely, absolutely right there. And it, I don't think we need to even joke about that one so much as because it might happen that when our world collapses, that these people may find a, a place to live in peace and happiness again. But the road to that point is not going to be a happy one and it's not going to be overnight. So, yeah, it's a, a worrying thought. Yes. But I hear your thoughts. Yes, you have a great story. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Judith, and thank you, Clive. Um, and then any other questions, you can either use the reaction tools or just wave or jump at me and I'll um, I will get to you. If not, okay, Andy, there we go. Andy, I'm going to ask you to unmute and you are more than welcome to take control of the screen. Oh, blimey, don't put me in charge or control of anything. Thank you very much, Clive. <laughs> I, I, I love these presentations from you. I think it's such an effective way of, of assessing how our society is. Uh, I, just as an aside, I, I was listening to a podcast the other day. I think you can get bombarded with up to 3,000 advertisements a day in, in sort of Western culture if you're online a lot. So we're up against a lot. So that whole consumption thing is there. Anyway, the, I don't know, it's not a question really, but could you tell us a bit more about the healing ceremony? It sounds like something we should all be doing. Correct. Um, yes. You know, when I first attended this healing ceremony, um, I actually expected that some guy was going to come in with a broken leg and going out doing flick flacks or something, you know. <laughs> but then I, I realized that this was not the case at all. They do a number of dances. But the healing ceremony is a dance which actually aims at a multinary um, purpose function. As I said, um, it actually reminds them of all the points that I made that were shown on the tree there. It reminds them of how to, to, to keep physically healthy. It reminds them of how important it is to actually live as a community and to belong. The sense of belonging then increases or improves their emotional well being. It actually gives praises, it, they dance to animals and where they, they thank these animals. So there's, there's gratitudes involved. And the energy that is actually created in those dances actually is, contributes to the bonding process in that community. So it's a whole process that they use to actually remind people of how they should be living. And the young people come in and learn their culture through this dance. And they, are, they communicate in different ways within this dance as well. And they also use this healing sometimes when there's conflict in the community. They will sometimes dance all night in order to, to heal any problems that there might be in the community. And they sometimes, they say, we dance until we see the star that runs before the sun. When they see the Venus or Saturn coming up, then they will actually then go up and have their sleep, et cetera. So, it's a dancing process, which is, it's a type of a, a meditation. It's a type of physical 
um, psychological and spiritual healing, which is done. It's a holistic and it's preventative. They don't wait until things are wrong. They see the importance of preventing things from going wrong, which is why you know, the word healing dance can be a bit misleading, but that's what it is. It's more preventative and holistic healing of, of everything that they consider important. Thank you very much. Um, Andy, any uh, comments on that or are you fine? I know that was fantastic, but I've just got another one for you from my, my world of useless facts locked away in my head. Um, the Special Air Service, everybody's heard their motto, who dares wins, but they're sort of tenants of operating um, relentless pursuit of excellence. So I guess that's the kind of not being lazy. Um, humor and humility are right in there. So that's kind of overlapped. And then the last one, I've got to get it the right way around, but it's a, a classless but not rankless society. So there's no formal structure but everyone takes responsibility for what they're supposed to be doing to support their community and their team. So correct. And you've got some strong guys on your side with, with what the Bush are doing. Anyway, I'll shut up and let somebody else have a go. Thanks very much again. <laughs> Thanks, Andy. <laughs> Thank you, Andy. Uh, brilliant. Peter, um, I was going to uh, come to you. You are very busy in the chat. So you are next as your hand is up. Peter, the screen is yours. Just unmute, please. <laughs> There we go. Hi, right, thank, thank you. Thank you, Clive, for your, for your talk. Um, I know the Bushmen, and I speak under correction, don't like to be called Bushmen. They like to be called Khoisan, or the, the, it's, it's not simply Bushmen. It's, the, there's a variety in San, Khoisan, and I, I know there's an issue about that. But that whole group of, of people are not homogenous and, and some still live like in the pictures that you portrayed but some have urbanized and so there's a there's a continuum of of of, of bushman for want of a better word culture from living traditional ways to those that have now accepted a more western lifestyle what do you, well, what's your comment on that? But I want to know is those who still live as traditionally as they can, what is their view of the, of, because we can't stop them from wanting education and wanting to go to the kids to go to school and so on. What, what have you got to say about that? It's quite a broad question there, Peter. Um, firstly, the, the name, um, I think that, um, I've mentioned this one before, but a word like Khoisan is really a collective name for people with similar uh, cultures because the Khoi and the San were very different. Um, the Khoi were pastoralists. The Khois had hierarchical structures. They had ownership, etc. So I don't even think it's fair to actually put them together. And so I prefer to talk about the, the name Bushman, which is considered pejorative in, in some areas. But where I work with the Gui Bushmen, the Gui actually means Bush people, so they've accepted that name, although it wasn't perhaps originally intended to be a, a compliment. So the, the name I use is San, they sometimes call themselves the Red People. Most of them like to be called the First People because they re really were the First People. And yes, there are not many left at all that are living the, the lives that they used to live. And they've basically been told that they are the lowest form of existence or made to believe that the lowest form of existence, which has actually played havoc with their minds. And I think it's not just them, but other Africans and throughout their continent are trying to imitate what the, what the Westerners have done. And I don't think it's doing the, pl the planet any good. So yes, there are a lot that aspire for to, to actually have some of the white man's privileges and benefits and riches, but basically that it's very much a, a culture in transition. And there are a couple, and they are really scattered, that, that are still living in the bush. Some are living like mavericks in the central Kalahari. But generally speaking, the bushmen that, we, that I talk about now, and it is a bit of a, a, a problem to actually get the tents right, because um, the way they were and the way they are now are, are rather different. And what I do with the Bushmen that I work with, they are now living in a resettlement area because they got removed from the actual central Kalahari and they are forced into the white man's world. So we take them back to the bush in order for them to practice their skills 
and try and share their knowledge with their young people in the hope that they are going to be able to pass on this uh, tradition and this heritage and that hopefully we can learn something from it. Thank you very Thanks, much, uh, Peter. You are still unmuted. Um, uh, any comments or other questions? No, thank you. Yeah, it's 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 a contentious thing, but um, but I I know that Sand Parks had a program of trying to. They've been persecuted in in countries north of the Central Kalahari. But um, I know that space has been made for them um, in certain parts of the Southern Kalahari. But I'd actually like to see them back in, in, into the old Kalahari Hemsport Park, or the, which is now Transfrontier Park. But you know, they should be, I think they should have access to, to that area. Thanks. Thanks, Peter. Thank you, Peter. Wonderful, thank you. And then Roland, um, I'm going to unmute you. You have your hand up. Screen yours. Thank you. Um, yeah, Cloud, it's very interesting. And I work in Angola, but I work right on the border with Namibia, and I work very closely with the Barakwena San, um, which are the river bushmen. Mm -hmm. um, we worked with them in the in this military, um, and actually, I was very concerned that the same would happen to them, that happened to 3-2 Battalion. They were 3-1 Battalion, and they were based in Omega. But uh, luckily, okay, they still have a problem with the Swapo government, but it's been a miracle in that uh, they are living, as they always have lived, in Bobata National Park. They live within a national park. And just going back to what Peter was saying about the, the, the sand park thing, uh, with the Namibian um, Nature Conservation, the Ministry of Environment and Culture, they've allowed them to continue, and they've actually formed an association called the Karamasan Association, which I work very closely with uh, across the board. We do uh, Transfrontier Park. Um, but is divided up into uh, three core area, three areas, of which two are core areas, and one is a general area around Omega, which is where the uh, Karamasan carry out their activities. And uh, they sort of mix in between in that um, uh, professional hunting is, so, is allowed within uh, Babuata National Park. And the uh, Karamasan Association are involved in that. And they also run lodges and take out uh, foot safaris, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. They are allowed to uh, gather things like devil's claw, mm. uh, and uh, which is a traditional medicine, um, and so they they sort of in the middle. They 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 have a, a pretty good quality of life in that uh, they have education, they have clinics as part of the um, of the Barakwena uh, Karamasan Association, and they are able to coexist with the with the park, allowing quotas. Uh, to be hunted, et cetera, et cetera. And there is a limited, they don't keep a lot of cattle because they never really did. Uh, goats mainly, and obviously uh, chickens and, and, and ducks and things. But it's a very nice, and I'm very happy to see they didn't go the way of 3-2 uh, Battalion, um, where they were, where 3-2 Battalion ended up in Pomfret, and it, it was an absolute disgrace, and uh, I think a blot on South Africa's history. But... Uh, the, they got, the Nobibians and Swapo actually got it right. And this is a lovely uh, success story. And um, if you would like to, anybody would like to know more about it, I work very closely um, with the Karamasan Association and the great work uh, that the Nobibian conservation authorities and the national parks are doing. Thanks, Roland. That That is good news. I have heard about it. I haven't dealt with them, but I've had I have dealt, and I had two um, Bushmen from the Nainai, which is obviously in Namibian as well, where they're also allowed to do, you know, some hunting and practice some of their traditional um, culture. Um, 
which has not been allowed to happen in the central Kalahari because that central Kalahari was actually given to the Bushmen in the 1950s. And at, um, at the end of uh, about 2000, the Botswana government actually removed them and said that no, they were poaching. But we've got copper mining and other things happening there. So I don't know what the real reason is. So yes, I know Southwest Africa or Nam Namibia has got it right. And we need to try and encourage people to try and support them because it's, it's not easy for them. And they're gonna to have to rely on tourism and to actually keep their culture going too. So that's, I'm pleased to hear that Roland and um, maybe we need to get in touch too. Thank you. I, so. I will put my email address onto the chat and okay. I will put, I'll also put on uh, the Karamasan Association. They have a WhatsApp group, it's amazing. Yeah, we've got the Barakwena San people. Yeah. And, and their uh, association is kept together with WhatsApp. Yeah. <laughs> but but by, the same, by the same token, they live their traditional values. They uh, revere their, their ancestors. They um, use their traditional medicines that like devil's claw and they, can, they sell it. And so even though with the, with the tourism, with the COVID virus, they still had an incredibly viable uh, uh, bio uh, pharma, uh, pharmaceutical industry uh, going uh, that's kept them going, and um, but so they've got a Western education. They can read and write and all that, but uh, they stick very very closely. Uh, they've still uh, their roots are still firmly with their ancestors. But right. I will put I will put the details onto my chat now. Thank you very much. Lovely. Thank. You. Thank you very much, Roland. Um, um, any other questions in the group? If not, I'm just going to refer to the chat se section. There are two book. Uh, there's one question. Actually, it's a it's more a referral to a book uh, from on us, um, Clive. Have you read Voices of the Sand, Living in Southern Africa, by Willemine Leroux? Um, uh, Liesl has provided us there with the link. Uh, I know uh, Willemine well uh, and count as a friend. So uh, it's, a, it's a great book. I've read it before. Uh, Clive, would you like to answer that? If you've read it before or not? <laughs> no, unfortunately, I haven't read that. No, I've read as many as I could find, but uh, Voices of the Sand, no, I must look out for it. I haven't read it. Love you. Know, definitely have a look. And then there was another book that uh, Mark Lottich spoke of. Uh, I just want to find it. Thank you, Clive, for serving up a change of perspective. Tyson Junkaporta, an uh, Australian Aboriginal philosopher, offers a superb and revealing analysis of the modern world from an Aboriginal perspective. Uh, the book Sand Talks, published in 2019, does a similar philosophical talk, take on the modern world, um, exists from a point of the Kalihari. Does a similar philosophical take? Oh, that's the question. Okay. Does a similar philosophical take on the modern world exist from the point of view in the Kalahari Bushmen? I think uh, most of your talk was answered by that. Uh, but thank you for that, Mark. Let's see. I just want to see in the chat section if there's any other questions, except um, Johan. Thank you for sharing, just uh, ladies and gentlemen. Look out for you on clear uh, sharing if you enjoyed it. He shared the link to the talk on the 1st of June on Share Screen Africa. Oh, wonderful. Any other questions? Marty, there we go. Uh, thanks again, Clive. Uh, your talk's always very um, thought provoking. And um, I, I think, kind of, you know, joining on to what was raised previously, it's almost the the whole philosophy of the bushman that has and, and their, their their way of approaching life has been almost what's caused their demise in terms of the competition with other people groups um where they are and um i, I was just wondering you know with the education that is happening i mean you almost need to have a situation where one of the um the bushman people remains true to their culture fully but is completely educated on a legal point of view that they can actually fight for their, their cause. Are there any um, of the people who have gone that route or has, as soon as they've embraced sort of Western life, they've actually left 
left behind? I mean, are there any um, of the people that are like, very well educated, but have still maintained in, in in the way of life that they they have. Is that almost a solution? I'm I'm just kind of trying to think how how do we um, make it better? Marty, um, I haven't come across any um, with, with a lot of legal training. I have come across to some well educated bushmen, and it um, it has been quite enlightening to see, you know, what they are really capable of doing, whatever, you know, any, any other human could do. So there's not a matter of there's any reason that they can't do it. But unfortunately, there's a lot of conflict in what the Western world is promoting compared to their culture. Those contradictions that they do, do confuse them. And some of them tend to actually um, succumb to the, the desires and the, and the, the benefits of the Western world. Um, but generally speaking, there have been, there have been a lot of uh, other people, um, Europeans, that have tried to fight for the Bushmen. They even won the court case. Um, uh, human rights won the court case um, against the Botswana government for them being expelled. But for some reason, they still haven't been allowed back in. So I'm afraid the odds are, are very stacked against them. And, uh, you know, when you're going up against uh, commercial operations like mining and etc cetera, etc cetera. it just seems that um, our indigenous people are, have, haven't got much of a leg to stand on the tide is, but, is really against them but but sometimes isn't it almost seen as being demeaning to the bushmen when other people have to almost speak on their behalf um i don't know there's there's this sort of like conflict um that, that, that happens where um I mean, they aren't children. They are, you know, fully um, capable human beings, as you say. Um, but it, but it's a it's a almost a element of their life that they don't want to engage with, which will assist them to to be able to fight for their rights. I, I, I don't know if that's just the whole pro problem with the whole thing. Yeah, it, Marty, I hear what you're saying. Even myself, I think, how am I talking about Bushmen, and I'm not a Bushman at all. And I think the reason I talk is because I know my culture and a little bit of theirs, and I can see the differences and where what I believe, you know, where we're going wrong, which is what makes me a little outspoken on it. But I think the Bushmen also, they're rather humble. And, um, you know, they don't speak out for themselves too easily, and they've been made to feel inferior in some ways, so they, they don't really uh, stand, stand up for themselves. But at least I haven't come across any myself who are in a position to, to actually do that and want to do it. And do they have aspirations of getting into government positions or leadership beyond their own? Or again, is that completely contrary to their, their mindset? The interviews and the ones that I've worked with, their biggest desire is to be given some land. They want to get back to the land of their own and they want to be able to do what they want to do. They want freedom. That is probably the biggest uh, um, request that I hear from the Bushmen. Just give us our land and leave us alone. That's what they want. No, thanks a lot, Claire. Okay, pleasure, Marty. Thank you very much, Marty and uh, Clive, for that. Um, thank you, Roland, for sharing the uh, your email and the um, information um, in the chat section. Um, any other questions from the audience? Uh, uh, I can't see any. Um, May, maybe Jane, Jane, you, you mentioned something in the chat, if you're still in. No, Jane isn't in anymore, but she, thanks Clive. I'm just reading out what Jane wrote. Uh, you might know of Gustavo, Gustavo Escobar's work on alternative development theories that coincide with some of the points you were raising, just mentioning his work in case you have came, come across it. Thank you. Wonderful. Uh, John Stewart's uh, hand is up, raised. John, I'm asking you to unmute. Well, right, folks, have you got me there? Yes, you, we can hear okay. you. Okay. Right, yeah. yeah, if you can see me, but you can hear me, can you, Ron? Yes, we can. Yes, we but, can. No, yes, we can. Um, it's, just, it's just an observation, um, slightly more maybe than a question, but I mean, there are some implicit questions that, that, that maybe people are interested in discussing. Um, it's very interesting in a case like this, often when we talk about uh, uh, things when there have been clashes of, of 
uh, the way people see their place in the universe, cultures, what have you, we, we do tend to, to concentrate on difference, even if in a very positive light. And um, sometimes I feel, um, this might sound somewhat trite, but sometimes I feel it's more important that we come from a perspective of uh, the, the common threads in humanity and what, what we have in common, because there would be plenty of people in other cultural groups who would hear, say, what is being discussed tonight, and that would resonate with them. They would find threads of that which are common in their own way of looking at the world. Um, and whenever we try to say, look, this is one way of doing it, or this is one way of looking at it, you have to put an enormous amount of caveats on anything before it sounds like a workable hypothesis as to how we can go ahead. Um, so I guess that's probably the point. I, I've noticed from working with a lot of cultural groups, and I've worked with, with um, Bushmen or whatever else you want to talk to, um, call people as well, um, I see plenty that is wonderful everywhere. Um, very, but it's very difficult when, say, somebody is being told by an outsider, and I'm not suggesting for a moment that that's what's been going on tonight. You know, this is what you've got is wonderful. What you had is incredible. We've all got to be like this here. We'd like to see you behave, you know, um, where they might be sitting there thinking, well, I want my kid to go to school and become a brain surgeon. Um, and I know a lot of what I'm saying is obvious, but I think we do have to accept sometimes that we're all in an evolutionary process together, um, take what threads we can from all around us and keep moving. So, um, yeah, oh, that's that's more or less my observation. Ruan, may I just ask, we had a John Stewart yes. this morning in, in the session with TUT. Is this the same John Stewart from Australia? <laughs> yes, yes, it is, Johan. Um, early morning for me today. I didn't want to miss this one. It sounded extremely interesting. What time is it there now? Um, it must be... It's about 25 past four, mate. Okay. <laughs> welcome. Welcome. <laughs> well, welcome and thank you. Thank you. I'm very sorry for a very long um, comment there. I sort of, uh, yeah, but I, I think you understand where I was coming from. It, it was a positive um, remark, but it's just that I think sometimes we do become wedded to certain ideas and it's interesting to discuss. Thank you. Sorry. Uh, John, if I can comment, I think that's a very valid comment. And I think that when you come to problem and, or problem uh, resolution, whatever it might be, that that is a, it's a great starting point because we've got a lot more in common than obviously we've got different. But unfortunately, we've got to get rid of our competitive natures and the ego in order to be able to accept other people's ideas and to and to share in what we've got. And that is probably one of the challenges that we've got that the Bushmen... Um, they, they didn't have that problem at, at all. Um, but now in our complex society, this is not an easy thing for us to achieve. But it is, it is an approach which I think is very valid. Thank, thank you. Thanks very much for that, Clive. And thank you again for a lovely presentation. Yeah, it's a, it's a worthy thing to consider that we deal with much greater complexity. We have to um, hold on to what we can and find new things as we move. So thanks very much, everyone. I'll get back to my seventh cup of tea. I'm on mute and sorry, let's go. Roland, I'm gonna give you a chance first and then Peter will move on to you. Okay, Clive, this is more a point of reference for you, which I'm sure you know already, but I think it's just good that everyone sort of gets to realize it. Okay, just a little bit of my background. I'm ex-Natal Park Sport. I was involved with Operation Rhino, et cetera, et cetera, in which time I worked with Ian Player. And in fact, I took over from his director of the Wilderness Leadership School. But uh, Player at that time had a very close relationship with Lawrence von der Post. Mm -hmm. And Lawrence um, did an incredible amount uh, with, the, with the San people. And, uh, and he obviously wrote, some, uh, Lawrence von der Post wrote a lot of, of, of material on them, especially on the spiritual side. And uh, I'm sure, uh, you know, just to bring it to everyone else's attention, but I'm sure you know about it already. Yes. Uh, okay. okay. Really books. Thanks, Roland. Okay, and just to, the, the 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 part about the Barakwena in 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 uh, in Babwacha National Park, which I left out, uh, those uh, um, Sam people, uh, many of them came from Angola. Uh, they were recruited by the uh, Angolan army. They were called Fletchers or Arrows, and uh, during the Civil War, they crossed back into Angola, 
And then we, in, in, in the South Defence Force, we, we uh, sort of uh, concentrated them mainly in, in Omega, which is where they have their, the, the old Omega base is where they have their town. And they worked for us at Fort Dopis, which, which was our uh, military base. And uh, we used them for tracking and stuff. And I worked with the, uh, the brother of the, the king, the paramount, whatever, of the Barraquena, the chap by the name of Shufflefoot, an incredible man with incredible endurance uh, and bush skills. And it was a great, um, for me, uh, a privilege uh, to have learned bush skills from a Barraquena. So that's just another added part that a lot of them came in from Angola, of which there are still some. I work uh, with some uh, Sam people in Angola around the Derico municipality. So they, there are still people of San origin in Angola as well. Yeah, wonderful experiences, Roland. Thank you. Hi, this is a slightly off point and anecdotal. Uh, director John Stewart, this morning you made a comment about uh, fire. And I, I just wanted to, but I didn't, and I should have made the comment that I'd rather manage African savanna than your eucalypts and your acacias because they don't burn, they blow up. <laughs> Uh, can you can you hear me there, Peter? Yeah, yeah, yeah I can. Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. I seem to imagine I made a mess with the video now. You can't see me, but you're not missing much. Um, <laughs> yeah, but it, it is it is an extremely complex question. And yeah, some of you who were around in your morning uh, may have heard me asking uh, Nick about that. Um, it is an extremely complex uh, situation to manage. And the main thrust of what I was mentioning this morning is about that that interface between your protected areas and, and your um, human interest outside of those areas, particularly grazing and pastoral um, properties, how people interact with protected areas. And yeah, over years, we have found more and more intense and explosive fire. Uh, a few years ago uh, in my unit um, in Queensland Parks where I was, we had all sorts of things occurring in a fire season that, ne that had never happened before, like areas of scrubline or rainforest that would normally stop a fire, actually having a crown fire go through at 11 o'clock at night. So things, I've sort of gone off topic, sorry, I'm wondering. But yes, I, I take your comment. Um, things are getting very, very much more explosive. And um, I guess just strap on a seatbelt and see how we go from here. Lovely. Thank you very much, Peter. Any so comments? sorry, Peter. Did that? I, 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 did I get everything that you were really wanting to uh, hear from me there, or just was that comment more or less what you were interested in? No, I just wanted to make the comment that it, it's, it's much easier to burn here in Africa than it is to burn in Australia. Because yeah, that's, that's just, absolutely true. That the difference because of your different habitat and and all the resins in your trees, they don't. And burn they just blow up yeah that's absolutely uh, true you get high fire danger uh, the oils and things in the air it becomes almost an explosive environment with very tall trees and, and almost gaseous at well all atmospheres are gaseous but but a highly volatile atmosphere that will actually ignite so yeah pretty pretty bad the, the, the bottom line is you guys don't want eucalypts and you don't want um our versions of acacias if you can help it <laughs> which you already know <laughs> Lovely. Thanks, Thank John. you, John and Peter. Um, I'm going to uh, just one question from the chat from Professor Enyam, all the way from Nigeria. Uh, he says, Thank you very much, Clive, for the wonderful lecture. It reminds me of the Poma people of the Middle Belt in, in Nigeria. Could they be related to the Bushmen historically? I don't, I don't know of them at, at all. I know in Tanzania they've got relatives, but in, 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 no, I don't know of those or haven't heard about them. Sorry. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Okay, lovely. Ladies and gentlemen, any other questions uh, from the audience? Um, if not, then uh, um, we are, I'm going to call it a night and say thank you very much again for